There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Friends, we have seen in the last several weeks a very disturbing sequence of events involving the nomination and swearing in of Brett Kavanaugh to be an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Following the news, you've been shocked, as I have, by the rancor, by the anger, by the rush to judgment, by the people on various sides of this entire discussion saying things that are undignified, that are unsubstantiated, that are without basis, trying to listen to the various voices and respect all involved and heed the concerns that have been brought forth has been dizzying as one's mind would just seem to spin around and around and around. I've been so alarmed by the rage, by the malice, by the tempers that have flared. Each time I would turn on the news, I would be shocked more than I had been before. And yet I found it so important, and not only for me, but for all of us and with our children and grandchildren, to help address those things that God says about words and their power to hurt, to strike, to injure, and even to destroy. But at the same time, to bring life and healing and peace and forgiveness and reconciliation with God and with each other. Sometimes we can't even think because of all the yelling that's going on in our culture. And for us as Christians to be self-controlled and patient and kind and gentle and fair sets us apart from the world in which we live. And to recognize that lying and deceit, false witnessing, these are things that arouse the judgment and the wrath of one far greater than any individual in a position of power in the United States of America, and that is Almighty God. And while we may not control the attitude or the actions or the words of others, we can certainly ask God to help us bridle our own tongues as we read in James 3, because they can be like a spark setting a forest on fire, like a rudder so small yet guarding, guiding a ship, or like the bridle in the horse's mouth that can direct that strong beast in whatever direction is intended. I want to start tonight by asking if you have seen this man on the news. I happened to hear of his story on the radio just the other day. Otherwise, I would not be aware of it because everything was about the Supreme Court and those that were partisan and those that were shouting and trying to outdo each other. But I found out that this man was arrested in August 1997 for the brutal stabbing death of a woman named Sharon McLean who lived here in our area in Bedford. His name is John Noley. 21 years later, he's been venerated, uh, exonerated, released, and now publicly declared to be innocent. After all of that time, based on charges and accusations that were brought so long ago, and it turned out I discovered the conviction was largely based on the testimony of a jailhouse informant who claimed that this John Noley had confessed to the murder. But the informant lied. Now they've interviewed 70 witnesses and completed 100 forensic tests. And they said that whatever print was found on the scene was not his. This 44-year-old husband and father of four, said that watching his mother age while he was behind bars kept me on my knees praying. 
And while he was in prison, he appealed his conviction without an attorney. His family ran out of money to hire anyone. And so the Innocence Project took on Noli's case. And that led to state legislation that requires prosecutors to get more information about jailhouse informants like the one used in Noli's trial. I don't relate this to you with a direct necessary correlation to any of the individuals in the recent scandal that we have witnessed. But it's a reminder of those things that God says regarding the tendency that might plague all of us to make an assumption, to draw a conclusion, to reach a verdict when all the data have not been collected or presented. And to put ourselves in the position of a man like John Noley Jr. And to realize that this is someone's son, someone's brother, someone's father, someone's husband. And look at all that he has been through. Here's what he said when he was released. Unbelievable. I'm just ready to let the water go under the bridge and keep going. Life's just been good, Noli said. The path I've traveled, it makes me better appreciate life and, you know, relationships. One article said he praised God. Tarrant County man's murder conviction overturned 20 years later. And his lawyer, Nina Morrison, with the Innocent Project said he praised God. He said he looked up at the sky and just took a deep breath. Remarkable, isn't it? Powerful and touching and moving. Because one of the things it shows us is no matter what others may say, what criticism they may bring against us. We can always choose to look up and praise God and take a deep breath and be who we know God wants us to be. There's an irony in all of these events that have taken place, and that is, without much reference at all to God during the conversations, or the Bible particularly, The principles used in our courts are based on the Scriptures. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 19. And these foundations are so basic, they're universally applicable. And any person who's being charged with any wrong would want to be treated just this way. And it's on this basis that our court system has developed the way certain situations are to be approached and resolved. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Oh, the fairness the equity, the truthfulness, the openness of the Word of God. You bring the two parties together before the Lord and objectively and fairly, reasonably and calmly and respectfully, you hear what parties have to say and you investigate. And if there's one witness, that witness is not to be heeded without substantiation, corroboration, verification. That same principle is found again and again. If you turn a couple of pages back to Deuteronomy 17 and verse 6, there we'll see it again. Deuteronomy 17, 6. On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. In Numbers 35 and verse 30, it's noted once more. But in the New Testament, you remember what Jesus said. 
If your brother sins, Matthew 18, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. And if he doesn't turn from his evil ways, you take one or two others. Why? So that every fact may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. And then if he'll not listen, tell it to the church. And if he won't submit and turn to repentance, then you treat him as an outsider, as a Gentile or a tax collector. How important is 1 Timothy 5.19? Do not receive an accusation against an elder except based on two or three witnesses. If there's sin, bring it out to the open so that others may be fearful of sinning. How many of us want to be treated this way? If there's a story going around about you or me, something from the past, and a rumor gets started, gets repeated, it gathers steam and force and energy, and suddenly there are people who accept it, who believe it, who endorse it. And then with passion and zeal, they insist that that's all there is to be said. What you would want and what I would want, what John Nolley in prison all these years would have wanted, would simply have been truthfulness, examination, and fairness. Make a note of Proverbs 18, 17. It's become one of my handful of favorite scriptures in that book. Proverbs 18, 17. What does it say? The first person to present his case always seems right until another person examines him. Let me ask if you have ever accepted the first report you heard about something and then you discovered there was more to it and you were mistaken and you didn't respond the way God would have had you to do? I have. You have. Others have done that to us. In our law, there's respect for the accuser to be heard openly and willingly because what the person says may be true. We don't shut that person down. We don't minimize a person because it's a man or a woman or old or young or rich or poor or from this area or from that. We don't prejudge a person based on their background or their experience or even the charge they make. In our culture, a person deserves to be heard, but also the accused then to face that accuser and treated with equal respect, hearing all the sides, presuming innocence until there's proof of guilt, insisting on corroboration. Lady Justice in the statue is blind because she's not to see color or age, or outward distinctions, or power, or weakness. But instead, under the law, every citizen of the United States of America stands on the same level playing field. And matters are to be addressed calmly and reasonably with tempers under control. Because it's not about a preset agenda, at least it ought not to be, there's not some animosity that's brought to the table by either side, but only a concern for what pleases God. The irony of all of this is that throughout this process, if an individual had made any reference to the Bible, what would have happened? If they'd said, the Word of God says, and isn't it odd? And our young people need to know this, but all of us, that our laws are based on this law. And to try to act on these laws without this foundation leads to the, what's been called a circus in the media and throughout this process in the preceding days. And I saw when, Chief Just, when Justice Kavanaugh was sworn in, there was a hand on the Bible. Did you see it? 
And it stood out with me because, you mean they're bringing a Bible into this process? It's such a paradox. And one other note was made. I didn't listen to all of the hearings. But there was a discussion taking place apparently in the Kavanaugh home. And the little girl, perhaps age 12, said, Daddy, shouldn't we pray for all these people? And I'm thinking, here's a child, two children. Here's a woman. If you watched anything, you saw the man's wife sitting there. And without prejudging, without assuming, without pointing fingers at anyone in the room, what we've seen is vindication that God's way is right. Naboth owned a vineyard in the time that Ahab was the king in the north, in Israel. When he refused to sell his vineyard, Ahab went home and pouted, and his wife Jezebel said, we can work this out. Let's have a dinner and put Naboth there, and let's seat a couple of scoundrels beside him, and they can begin spewing out accusations, and we can technically get around this thing about two or three witnesses. Let's just call in the people we want, get them to say what we like. Same thing happened when our Savior was on trial. The chief priest and the Sanhedrin had already determined the verdict. We're going to put him to death. We need some reason. And so the scripture says in Matthew 26 that they sought false witnesses. They went out and looked for people that would speak what they wanted them to say. And when Caiaphas asked Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of the Most High? And Jesus said, yes, you've said it. Then the high priest responded, what further need do we have of witnesses? Now we can move forward just on this alone. So it's nothing new that suddenly there are people on all sides of all kinds of things would try to work out something according to some plan, some insistence, some principle. It may be underlying it is some political pressure to do this or that. And so to claim neutrality and objectivity and rationality while at the same time orchestrating this and that reminds us of the fact that because we are sinners, there is to be a process that is clear, that is straightforward, and that cannot be criticized by open-minded people. God speaks often about the things that we say. Proverbs 18, we already mentioned verse 17, First one to present his case seems right till another examines him. Verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Chapter 12, 18, one can speak rashly like thrusting a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Chapter 16, 28, a perverse man can spread strife and a slanderer separate intimate friends. How? Not necessarily with a bomb or a gun or an arsenal, but with this thing right here. You and I could devastate. We could wipe out. We could undermine and destroy the reputation and the character of someone else. And we could even believe we're doing it sincerely. Because we may remember something honestly in our own mind and we may tell it with conviction as 100% sure. But unless it's vindicated, unless it's certified, unless there's something to substantiate it, that's why God put these things in place. One goes about as a slanderer and reveals secrets. 
Don't associate with a gossip. If a person will tell you the secrets of others, they will tell others your secrets. And when they begin with don't tell anybody but, and then they want you to side with them in some judgment against a third person that's not even present. And you can't talk to that third person. You're just supposed to accept what you're told. For lack of wood, fire goes out. And if there's no whispering, there's nothing to feed the fire. Going down like dainty morsels and affecting even the inner parts of the body. God warns us against the backbiter the backstabber that would attack with sharp words from behind, or the tattler, the idle, the wandering busybody that says things that should not be spoken. In Titus 2, 3, the word rendered malicious slanderer is the word from which we get diabolical. In fact, diabolos, diabolos is the Greek word for the devil. And there's a devilish way of speaking. Satan is the accuser. He is the one trying to find fault, trying to fix the blame and cause us to suffer. And whenever we do that to someone else unfairly, that is diabolical. That is devilish. Or the complainer, Jude notes in verse 16, that boasts loudly and plays favorites to gain advantage. Jeff Abrams, personal friend, has written a book entitled Sticks and Stones, a study of hurtful words and helpful remedies. It might be a book that would benefit you as it has me. He describes the enemy as a roaring lion that wants you for dinner. He wants your tears for his beverage, your ruined reputation for his entree, your crippled effectiveness for his dessert. Satan is a glutton for gossip. He fattens up on whispers. He feasts on foolish talk. And he cleans his plate with dirty accusations. Do words hurt? Ask the cheerleader who has a reputation with boys that is not accurate. Ask the child who's called stupid by his dad. Ask the employee that's wrongly accused and tell his family we have to move. Ask the first grader who was called ugly names on the playground. The bachelor that folks whisper might be gay. The coach's wife that hears her husband slammed by the experts in the stands. The politician whose career is ended by a vicious negative ad. Ask the victims of witch hunts, Jeff writes, burned at the stake because somebody whispered a wild accusation. Ask the parents who buried their teenage girl because she could no longer endure the taunts from the popular girls. During World War II, Jeff notes, to emphasize the destructive potential of careless talk, the Office of War Information distributed posters with images of soldiers that lost their lives and sinking ships and grieving families. And the images that were so graphic were accompanied by the words, Americans suffer when careless talk kills. Somebody blabbed, button your lip. Loose lips may sink a ship. And a careless word, a needless sinking. One that was especially blunt, depicted a talkative person and the caption said, wanted for murder. This person's careless talk cost lives. Jesus spoke powerful words. A devil was trounced. A storm was stilled. Lazarus came forth. A mob dropped its rocks. Lepers were cleansed. Murderers were forgiven. A thief found paradise. Oh, the power of good words. Moses spoke and Pharaoh trembled. Elijah spoke and caught a ride to heaven in a chariot of fire. Jonah spoke and a city avoided a fire and brimstone shower. Esther spoke and her people were saved from massacre. 
John the Baptist spoke, and a wicked generation repented. Peter spoke, and some 3,000 souls got a second chance and a new name. Paul spoke, and there was a midnight miracle, an averted suicide, and a family saved in that jail in Philippi. But then Jeff notes the other side, those words that are so destructive and inflammatory. Satan spoke deceptively, and a family lost its innocence, its home, its hope, and two sons. Jephthah spoke rashly, and think of the loss of his daughter. Goliath, loudly and proudly, and a shepherd boy with a good arm, took him out. Haman spoke vengefully, hanged on his own gallus. Herod spoke impulsively, John the Baptist was beheaded. Judah spoke greedily, and a conspiracy to commit murder was launched. Peter spoke profanely, and his best friend was betrayed when he denied him three times. Pilate spoke ignorantly, and the Messiah was brutalized. Ananias and Sapphira spoke dishonestly and immediately fell down dead. Herod spoke arrogantly and was eaten by worms. Oh, the power of words. Hurtful and helpful, depending on how we use them. Think can be an acronym that asks that we taste what we say before it leaves the gate. Is it true? Are we sure that it's true? If we're not sure, we won't tell it, or certainly not tell it as if it is true. Is it helpful? And who does it help? Does it help me or does it help someone else? Does it help righteousness and the kingdom of God and the cause of Christ? Or is it petty? Is it mean? Is it out to score points myself? Is it important? It may be interesting, but is it important? Could it be left unsaid and not be necessary? Is it kind to all those involved? And does it pass the test that no corrupting talk? The Greek word has to do with that which is rotten, that which is putrid, that which is defiled. No corrupting talk. but only what is good for building up, what fits the occasion and gives grace to those who hear. It's speech that's gracious and seasoned with salt and fits the needs and the situation and the concerns of other people. Passing that test, regardless what others may do, will assure the fact that what I speak and what you speak will not contribute to that which God calls an abomination. Lying, deceitful words, unfair words, charges and accusations, gossip and slander and libel. It's not been my aim tonight to address all the specific individuals and questions and concerns that have barraged us recently in the news. Neither has it been to state something beyond that which God has told us to say and to do. But when you and I bring a clearly Christian perspective to the news and to current events and to our culture, we shine our light with the salt of the earth and people can see that which is fair and equitable and just and good, which is the result of the Spirit of God in our hearts and in our lives. What are the greatest words ever spoken? It would be hard to top these. Your sins are forgiven. That's the gospel message. That's the promise the Lord makes to one who turns from sin and confesses Jesus' name and is clothed with Him in baptism. Colossians 3, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. And that person then rises claiming those great words and living them out and offering grace 
and kindness and truth and honesty and fairness to all those in our lives. If you'd respond to the Lord's invitation, why not now? Let's sing. Shall we stand?